welcome to the Beginner's Handbook. This time we're going to be talking about player versus player. So it's a subject I think we've had a recent experience playing, but certainly we've, we've had more than one kind of scenario or encounter with something like that. Um, I've not personally done one myself, but uh, we'll be talking about it today anyway. Um, but before we start, I'm Jordan, um, and this yeah, is... And I'm Jamie, and... As, as we said, this is Beginner's Handbook, so this is a podcast which is based on Dungeons & Dragons specifically, but we do delve here and there into other RPGs, so the aim is to get people playing if possible, if they haven't played, or if you've started playing, maybe give you a tip or a trick here or there, and if you're an experienced player, then you know join in in the debates and discussions that might be going on in different social media platforms, t- uh, Discord, uh, Facebook, places like that. Yep. But yeah, player versus player, um, or as <laughs> this episode could also be called, Treachery in the Camp. Yes, uh, we'll get to that um, very shortly. It's player versus player. It's something that you're going to come across at some point, you know. Even something as small as you guys are fighting over loot, you know, you and one of your teammates, let's say it's Jamie and I, want this guy's magic sword yeah. together. Yeah, let's, let's, let's say yeah. it's you and me. <laughs> yeah, and um, yeah, and I want that sword more than he does. So usually there's going to be some form of conflict and then a resolution to come afterwards. That something as simple as that is is technically still PvP, um, but we've actually had a very recent encounter of PvP that was a bit more um, meaty. Meaty, yeah. Juicy, but, yeah. It was good, good for me, <laughs> not so much Jamie. We'll, yeah. we'll cover that shortly though, so stay tuned. But yeah, so why don't we just get started then? So I think the first thing is before we even get into our experience, if you have an experience with PvP good, bad or indifferent, let us know in either the comments or any of the socials that we have like Discord Um, and just we're curious to hear what other people's experiences are like because while I've not run kind of hardcore PvP before and Jamie's ran some PvP himself and the guys that we tend to play with a lot have done a fair bit but it's only ever been the kind of PvP we've been experienced with so we'd love to hear your, your victories and, and probably horror stories with them. <laughs> yeah. Um, again, that's the thing. Like, let us know, you know, the, the situation, the scenario of the game as well. Because, mm-hmm. um, again, like we said, it could be from a totally, totally different RPG yeah. that you've been doing it in. Um, so let us know all that. Let us know what was good. Let us know what was less than good. Um, and as well, if there was anything creatively that you had to do to resolve any of the situations let us know that as well but yeah um all sorts of places to get in touch with us and let us know about that yep perfect so why don't we just jump straight into it so normally we would have topics or kind of areas we'd like to cover but for this one we're actually going to do it a wee bit differently and we're going to break it into some of the games that we've had we've got examples of pvp um in them and we're just going to cover some of the things like maybe what's happened in them, kind of the context around the PvP, mm. and maybe what we would change or not change about them. Um, but interestingly, we're going to we're going to do it like that. So the first one we'll start with is a James Bond game that we've done, or I say we done. Jamie ran, and uh, I, yeah. I had the the pleasure of playing and and PvP in two other guys or up to two other guys. Yeah, so we'll, we'll dive into that and we'll start explaining what was going on. So if you've followed any of the previous episodes, then you will know this is the disaster game. This is this was the game to end all games from <laughs> from the point of view of running it. So if you've seen an episode before where I've talked about that, this is that game, okay? This is maybe part of the reason why it kind of was a bit challenging, shall we say, to run. But um, but anyway, that's that's a kind of different story for another time. So in this game, what it was is we used the Call of Cthulhu um, system, and that's is that seventh edition we used. Yes, it is. Yeah. yeah, seventh edition. They go off the top of the head, right? So that was the system that we used. But what we done is we set it in the kind of the world of Bond. Um, and and that's what we've done there. So we kind of 
chopped and changed bits and pieces and just it was only designed to be a one shot um, so we, we tweaked quite a lot into it but it's not really relevant so we'll ignore that and we'll skip past it so one of the ideas that I had for it was rather than everybody is part of MI6 or some other allied agency and you're going to go through the game and then you're going to hit the objective and happy days, everybody has a good time and goes home. Uh, no, I decided to make it much more complicated than it had to be. So what I decided to do um, is set it in the 80s. So you had Cold War going on. So basically you had, you know, the West and the East essentially is what was going on there. So MI6 and Allies and KGB and Allies, roughly speaking. And then what I thought, rather than, there's your choices, everybody make your choices, right, okay, you know, um, the person that's normally our DM and uh, someone who we'll refer to as the chameleon for the rest of this episode, just to kind of keep anonymity and just to, you know, make them seem more interesting. Um, so rather than going through, and Jordan, of course, as well, rather than going, right, okay, you pick, you pick, you pick, Right, now we know what faction you're on. Right, now we'll start the game and then we'll get get going. Now, what I decided to do was I contacted everybody and told them to let me know what faction they were on, but secretly. You know, you're in a spy game. Uh, well, sorry, we're doing a spy game. You know, spies have secret identities and all that sort of thing. Makes sense. Perfect. Right, let's go for that. So... That, that was how the PvP started. Everybody picked a side and it could have worked out that everybody was on the same side. It didn't work out like that, but that's that's what happened. We, we, we went for chance, for, you know, and, and that's what we came back with. So what happened is Jordan, and again, our usual DM, we'll just call him the DM, even though it was me. That might get confusing, but we'll stick with this just now. So Jordan and the DM, um, in fact, we'll change it. We'll call him the author. I always call him the author to keep it, to keep it together. Because he's normally writing storylines for us. That's that's what we'll do. So Jordan and the author, they ended up picking the same side, which was. <laughs> if you could it was remember. the KGB. There it was the KGB. So there it was a lot of fun. So they, the accent gave it away though. I think when they, um, the author had kicked it an accent, and I was like, ah, he must be in my team. <laughs> Yeah, okay, uh, we we'll, won't we'll dive into that. Um, and then the chameleon, he went for MI6 or the West, you know, whatever we yeah. want to divide that up to. So during the game, the players had to figure out who was in their side, who wasn't in their side, and then work towards what the goal was. Um, now, of course, they didn't have to do that, but it would make things a bit easier for them if they did, um, or at the very least, they'd know who was trying to stab them in the back. But that was that. Was that. So before the game as well, it was a one-shot. So if anybody did take out another player character, another PC, you know, five minutes into the game, we get shot, that's it, end of, that's them out of the game, then, well, nobody, or at least this was my thinking, nobody would be particularly upset or bummed out that that happened because it's a character that they've just came up with for the game, it's only a one-shot, we're not planning on revisiting this anytime soon, so that should kind of negate some of, some of the challenge, again, that's what I was thinking there. Um during the game as well because I went right well you can't have somebody bumping somebody off five minutes into the game and then have them sitting there for a couple of hours not saying anything not doing anything so what I decided to do was set the main sequence in a large party so you've got lots of people walking about that are civilians that can escape go and phone the police get them to turn up um, so odds wise it wouldn't be great if you just randomly go in and start blasting away and as well put quite a lot of security in the game as well to try and limit the amount of 
player on player violence that might have appeared. Just in, as um, as appealing as it was, it did work. I didn't start shooting everybody straight away. It came later, I think. Yeah, yeah. later on when <laughs> when <laughs> things started to accelerate, that's when that all happened. But the other thing as well is, I mean, like in, it's something like Dungeons and Dragons, which is you know your fantasy world, where you know it's set in a feudal time or whatever's going on where you know there's less laws and less enforcement of laws because the Bond game you know it's although Bond itself is fantasy you know realistically it's set in the real world so you know if you if you pull a gun out in a party people are going to panic and run you know nobody's going to yeah. hang around and you know decide to see what's going on so it's worth that. also saying as well um, for anyone that's not played Call of Cthulhu it's also a lot more lethal than, than mm-hmm. D&D is so that was also a, a big deterrent from it because once you get up a couple of levels in D&D you can at least tank some big hits mm-hmm. but in Cthulhu your hit points are your hit points pretty much the whole time and if you get you get, I think half your hit points I think the maximum hit points you can get is around 12 mm-hmm. so I mean in D&D that's a barbarian kind of maxing out at level 1 but once you get half your hit points, you're, you could be going down. So yeah, but yeah. Anyway, yeah, yeah. That's exactly it. And again, that was one of the reasons why the Cthulhu system was the system that I took and tweaked rather than D and D and using that. Um, so that's kind of sort of the basics of what happened and and how it came about. So each side was selected at random by the players. And then I found out what it was when they got back to me, which made it interesting mm-hmm. for me, but also it kept it random. Um, again, we said it is in a kind of real world sort of situation, which meant that it would limit the amount of time that the players would actively be trying to, you know, <laughs> kill the other one, I suppose, um, just to kind of put it bluntly. And as well, because each player, even if they were on the same side, didn't know that, until they used a bit of spycraft and whatever else to start working that out and figuring it out and piecing together some clues that started to get left. But that that was basically everything from that game in a nutshell and that's the kind of context behind it. Yeah, do you know, I'm actually interested to know because I've not done... Because, I, I mean, the game was built probably, if it's fair to say, like a major mechanic of it was the potential of PvP being there from the start because you'll get yeah. opposing forces really and mm-hmm. you'll have alternative goals or whatever they may be. Mm-hmm. Um, was there any sort of prep work that you pro- you might have put into? Like, I'm just trying to think if I was running it, how would I have done it? Um, like, so what was what was your choices when you were thinking about the potential PvP stuff that could have came up? And I know you can't predict half the time what's going to happen, mm-hmm. or at least if you do, it never follows through. <laughs> um, but is there anything you've done in particular to kind of facilitate or at least p- manage the PvP before it happened, like when you were prepping the game? You've talked about having in uh, guys there to avoid the violence and instant mm-hmm. PvP and having spycraft there to make it a bit more ambiguous about who's actually mm-hmm. on your side or not. Um, but is there any other kind of prep you've done around, well, potentially when PvP actually kicked off? Yeah, so again, if you've looked at previous episodes where you've heard me talk about this game and it being a complete disaster... Um, was I that a deterrent used, for PvP? The, yeah, the it was. Technical it, issues it, we had? It, it was just a deterrent for playing a game that I ran for any of you <laughs> in the future. Um, no, what what I'd done is because this was the first game that I ran, I was hmm. I was really conscious about not having enough content, and I was conscious about the storyline being vague and not enough, and people losing interest and things like that. So. I had doubled down on the technology that was available, so we've done that through Roll20, mm. uh, which is a virtual tabletop if you've not used it or you don't know. So in Roll20, you can add music, you can give players different documents and handouts and, and different th- different things, but there's lots and lots of things that you can do. So I really doubled down on the technology. 
And one of the things that I've done, um, and I'm just thinking, we haven't really properly talked about this, actually, no, this at all. So this is literally the first time that you're kind of hearing mm-hmm. why I've done certain things. So one of the things that I've done um, when I was coming up with the direction that I wanted the players to move and go in and things is I, I wrote it from... I wrote as if there was actually something decent happening. <laughs> no. Um, so I came up with what was going to happen and all I'd done was I mirrored it for each each faction, each side. So each side get told that there was this rumour going about that something was being developed and they thought that it was a biological weapon but each side get told that the other side wanted it and was involved with it somehow and that each side was going to turn up and then get the information or the actual weapon itself and then escape with it. Everybody had the exact same goal. The reason for that was to keep it simple for me, tracking it, what was going on. Um, So everything that you were getting told, the chameleon was getting told as well. Mm Mm-hmm. And the way that I did that was I used handouts. And I, I can't remember what I called it, but I think I had it like incoming intelligence and then I just labelled it MI6 or KGB. So I would then update that document as the game was progressing and all I was doing was copying and pasting information in that was already laid out. And then that would appear in the document. And then all I would do is I would say over the mic, that's intelligence came in for whatever the faction is then what it meant is it was up to the players to then secretly and not obviously start looking down at their screen or whatever which if you were switched on and paying attention you could have done and could have figured out Um, it was then up to them to get a hold of that information that I'd given them secretly so what I was doing there was right okay this seems like you know there's somebody's going to discover who the the other person is working for a bit too early, update the intelligence, and then what that would do is it would break the game because they'd have to go away, they'd have to read it, and it'd kind of slow the pace down a bit. What it also let me do is if the pace was not going quick enough, I could start dropping intelligence into that and start speeding things up and start getting the game to go. So, in other words, in that document I had essentially, like, show notes and I was just revealing that as time was going on I was using that to either speed up or slow down the pace and occasionally I was putting the odd thing in that was just a bit of a red herring just to slow it down one particular thing that I'd done was because I went right at some point if like say yourself and the author hadn't clicked that you were both in the same faction let them know that was happening so I put in a kind of the crow flies east but only at midnight kind of mm-hmm. you know secret message code word thing for each one to say so I got them to do that so then you just confirmed that you were both in the same faction I'd done the same thing for the chameleon but what I'd done is I picked a random guest at the party who had nothing to do with it it was just a random character um, and I'd done that just to kind of use a bit of the time uh, and I don't think the chameleon was too happy after the game. <laughs> right enough, I, I seem to remember he was a bit upset about that. I, I do remember this. I know that we might cover this a wee bit later, but one of the things that I think is important when it comes to PvP is like trying not to meta a game. Mm. You don't, you try not to meta a game. If you don't know what that is, it's it's like going, oh, I know Jamie's a bad guy in this, so I'm going to treat him like the bad guy, although my character doesn't know he's a bad guy. That sort of mm-hmm. stuff. Because um, I think that was probably around the point where I was like, right... The chameleon is definitely MI6. <laughs> and with that information, I could have quite easily just tried to kill him, you know. Mm-hmm. But I was like, nah, my guy doesn't know this yet, you know. So it was it was quite interesting. I actually quite liked that kind of at time slow release or faster release of information because that's actually, if I, other than the accent, which gave it away from the author, it was the thing that kind of, while I had suspicions that he was with me, it was that information mm-hmm. and kind of seeing how he was interacting with it because I'm mm-hmm. going well if he if he's on the same side he'll have it at the same time the, the intel yeah and I was getting to see him do stuff on, and I was just playing dumb sometimes you know mm-hmm. um, and then that's when I finally made the approach about 
the stork flies east, but not over the plains in the west or whatever the thing was. You yeah, know? yeah, I, I can't, I can't remember what it was. Um, but yeah, yeah. But I, can, I quite enjoyed it. Think. Yeah, I enjoyed yeah. that release, and I felt it was definitely better not to make a game, especially after he could tell that the chameleon was just was like looking forward to having a buddy that turned out just to be a scared party guest when everybody yeah. started shooting at each other. Uh, yeah. Purely by chance, you know, that happened as well. Mm. It wasn't supposed to be just like misdirecting someone, you know, it was more just something, I, I remember the phrase was something fairly regular that you could slip it into conversation. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, so the chances are it could have been said so it was good though um, for me as a player it kind of got me excited when I was figuring out like for the problem solving because I was thinking I was going to have to kill my, my two guys I thought what you were going to do was have the guy that was on my side actually be f- from some third party that I wasn't expecting mm. you know like one of these Scandinavian crime shows but it's always somebody else who comes in later that did the killing in the first place and I was like okay I'll need to kill both of these guys mm. so from a player perspective I quite enjoyed just the uh, seeing everything click into place the puzzle almost yeah yeah and essentially that that was what i was trying to do throughout the whole thing keep everybody on their toes as much as possible keep everybody guessing keep everybody thinking so that the player versus player aspect was paranoia i suppose Mm -hmm. and that the players were trying not to engage with the other player because that could be potentially dangerous for them, which then ultimately meant that, you know, again, nobody was getting killed off too early and that it would mm, minimise any kind of aggro that might have came up from that. Um, that was the kind of the goal from mm-hmm. a lot of it. And again, with the release of intelligence as well, because the chameleon, he was by himself, I could then use that to go, right, well, because you're by yourself and because as soon as the other two work this out and if it, you end up in a quieter area then you know you're, you're toast you're getting smoked then I could release information to him quicker to get him moving through the scenario quicker to then potentially keep him there for a bit longer and things so I could use it to kind of balance the odds and although I wasn't there and playing as a player I could get him the information to then give him the advantage and be a step ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, for me it was a lot of fun, especially just when I started getting up to my usual nonsense where just, you know, sneaking. I think I remember jumping down behind a bunch of guards when stuff kicked off. Yeah, down two flights of stairs, yeah. Yeah, I think there was, was it not the MI6 guy? Something happened, there was some event that happened or... I don't know if he thought this guy was part of his group and then he started fighting them. I can't mind, but I ended up just using that opportunity to just do a bunch of nonsense mm-hmm. to get down the stairs. And I think when we get down the stairs, that's when the real PvP kicked off, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, because that's when you were pretty much, you know, in the scenario at the end point before the yeah. kind of final, final scene, if you like. Um, but, yeah. yeah. It was quite a few bits of kind of... To keep us on our toes, you know, because I think, if I remember right, I'm pretty sure it was this way, I, I, I was introduced as a different character initially. Yep. Um, just Again, spies have secret identities, nothing unusual about that. Yep, and, I, oh, that's the other thing, which is quite interesting. So, and it's something that, this is kind of coming off the PvP topic, but if you're going to do a game that's a one-shot, you know, don't be afraid to kind of do take some interesting choices with it because like we knew going in that there was probably going to be pvp if i if i remember right and but we also knew it was probably we wouldn't survive um i remember how i get killed and it, mm-hmm. i wasn't expecting that um and we'll, we'll cover that in a minute but um yeah so i mean but that's like i, I actually had a different character i think completely and then i came in in a hot air balloon because that was my whole thing i'd had this nonsense about wanting to be in a hot air balloon um, so Jamie graciously let me do that at a bit that would be yep. appropriate um, mm-hmm. whereas I just played some pleb until that point I think I can't remember yeah, yeah. so long so, ago now so basically you played a generic person who was mingling about at this party until That's the big entrance and then this random person just disappeared so that was I don't know 
15 minutes of everybody's oh, time just gone like that away yeah it was fun it just it kept us all guessing you know especially and, uh, and again that's the thing when you said that I went yeah great because if you do that then everybody else as soon as they think yeah obviously he's in my faction obvious then something like that happens and then everybody goes mm, right okay back to the notes right what's happened what's not happened why has this happened and again mm-hmm. just keeps everybody in their toes gets them thinking gets them rethinking yeah so how is it then when you were running the game how did you what was your process when the pvp started particularly so basically for context there was all this stuff going on and then you go downstairs and there was like some super soldier thing going on if i remember right Mm -hmm. but anyway there's some guy that we ended up both both factions mi6 and kgb had Mm to but we weren't working together at all but we we knew that we were both trying to get rid of this guy or something but that's when just before that all kicked off pvp occurred where it was like i think mi6 guy was sneaking about and we were doing our thing but i was also aware that we were being tracked so i was looking out for the mi6 guy um can you give us any insight into how how is it you manage the pvp elements because this was before it got violent but it was clearly <laughs> approaching that at that point so i'm curious just mm-hmm. how, what was your tools so to speak that you used other than the the music and stuff that didn't work um, what were the tools that uh, is that a sore spot still after like a year yeah, and a half? Yeah, still a bit. Yeah. Um, but how is it? What was it that you'd done to manage those bits and especially the build up? Because I think the actual PvP itself probably wasn't that hard. It's like okay, just shoot them then and do your role. But there's all the stuff leading up to it. Did you have to do not interfering? Did you have to do anything where you had to put stuff in the way or anything like that? Or did, how did you let it unfold? If that makes sense. So at that point, basically what happened is there was a room that the party was in. There was the stairs that took you down into a kind of a living area in this kind of plush ski chalet, you know, megalomaniacs mm. getaway yeah. kind of thing. So I can't remember who went down the stairs first, if it was... The, the chameleon went down or if it was you and the author went down and then you know he yeah. then followed I can't 100% remember I think you guys went down first yeah we did I? and then the chameleon followed because yeah. you done your athletic jump down the stairs and you pulled it off and then that was that was you in and yeah. then that was it so basically in this area that they went into it's you know room after room after room after room Mm -hmm. and then before that what had happened is there was like a kitchen area that they had to go through that was there for taking food up to the party and was in between the the different areas Um, you know somebody that's posh enough to have a kitchen which is a full floor in their house you know that's that's the kind of parties that this guy was throwing so you had to get yourself past chefs and waiters oh, and not, right, uh, yeah. everybody like that where we are clearly in party gear um, to then go downstairs into the living area um, so that was the first kind of bit that was set up to slow it down so that when you turned up you went right okay it's really really busy and there's lots of people moving about how am I going to get past here um, I can't 100% remember how you used get past. I think there was like a catering trolley. I think one of us had in a trolley. I th- yeah. feel like somebody put a chef's hat on, but that just might be rose tinted goggles thinking back to it, to be honest. Because yeah. I know I wanted to do that, but I don't think I had to go. Yeah, goal. again, I can't remember um, how it happened, but you two guys get through and then get into that area. So that was the first thing that was designed to kind of slow you down. Mm-hmm. And whoever got there first. And again, you're knowing full well that everybody's there and everybody can see the yeah. decision that's getting made so that the other person, the other group is then going to follow in afterwards. Right? You know that's going to happen and you know that the second group is going to try and get through the same way that the first group got through if it was successful. But that first group that gets to that challenge, that obstacle, they need to puzzle that out. Now, the secret for that point there was that the guys are all terrified of their boss so they're just making the food they don't care they are so hyper focused in that and the waiters are down they're grabbing stuff they're straight back up so they're never there for any length of time 
So you could have literally just walked past that scenario at that point. There was no real obstacle there, or no real obstacle that I was planning and putting there, but it was just to put that kind of stumbling block in that we need to think of a way around this. So that's what that was there for, to kind of, again, control the pace to some degree. You then get into the room downstairs, and I think there was kind of 12 rooms in this particular map off the top of my head, Mm -hmm. complete with cupboards, which we'll maybe come on to in a second. Uh, So it was basically find where either the lab was, the location of the lab, a computer, hard drive, you know, anything. Just look for information, evidence, get something, grab it and, you know, get out, don't get caught. So basically, you all had to search the place. So I picked a room randomly beforehand um, and basically there was a computer that was sitting there and it wasn't particularly well hidden. It was, you know, you're in this guy's house, he's got his computer there, and that was it. But because there was the 12 rooms, then you go, right, okay, well, there's a 1 in 12 chance that you're going to pick it right. And then after your 1 in 12 chance, if you then decide to go into one of the cupboards that was maybe in one of the rooms, then that's decreasing that down again. So that that's what it was. It was just literally a game of a chance at that mm-hmm. point. Mm-hmm. Now... Because you had to go down the stairs to get to the room, it then meant that the stairs were creaky stairs, honest. Right, so it meant that you and the author, when you were downstairs, oh, you hear a noise upstairs. Again, based on whether the chameleon passed a, a successful, would that be a would be stealth, sneak, uh, would it, for Cthulhu? I can't remember maybe, if it's yeah. sneak or stealth, the way it's described, but basically, he had to pass a check, didn't happen alerted the two guys oh somebody's here but at that point they don't know whether it's um, the the MI6 agent at this point I alerted them that there was other agents operating mm-hmm. and again I used the intelligence at this point to imply there was a bigger number so that from your point of view you're sitting going alright oh, okay are there NPCs that are then working yeah. with the other agent Again, keeping everybody on their toes rather than figuring out, right, it's just him, let's pop him in a, uh, <laughs> you know, when we're outside and then that's it, done, end of, and then you can carry on in peace. No, at that point, I implied that there was more people there. I left it just the three of you guys just to keep it a bit more streamlined, but I had that potential threat mm-hmm. in there just to keep everybody on their toes and behaving. Um and then he comes down and he starts moving through the place as well and potentially you guys could get into conflict at that point and that was the first point where I was comfortable letting a bit of conflict happen but the way it worked out you just ended up missing and avoiding each other Yeah. and then I can't remember if the chameleon found the the computer first with the information I think I hacked it or something I did something I I had a computer background or something I think yeah yeah so whoever found the computer at that point got the information but then the host of the party reappeared at that point um, took the hard drive that was removed from the computer he started to run then it started a chase at that point again at that point you guys could have taken out the MI6 agent then carried on the chase but the way that he were in the room it meant that he was slightly ahead of you you were slightly behind which meant that because you're having to move through room to room you didn't have a good opportunity to do that and then it led to the, the final chase and then um, the chameleon got away empty handed he never got the hard drive the author got the hard drive you got the hard drive and then the author shot and killed you and threw you out of the flying snowmobile. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't know the the um, the rationale that was behind that, unless there was another um, kind of background thing. But I was 
more than happy to just well it was the end of the night so I'm like no problem just dance me yeah. <laughs> finish me off and I'll go to bed because <laughs> it was online <laughs> yeah and again because of the technical issues there was a delay in starting and then it just ah that's it, right it, it, a lot of this dragged because we were <laughs> we had to kind of cobble a lot of stuff together um, I think the rationale behind that was he, he misunderstood what I'd meant at the start of the game so there was a miscommunication there so though the two of you guys were working together he didn't actually properly realise that you were on the same side as him because you were different nationalities so oh, rather than you were both okay. recruited through the oh. same agency he went right. well I'm working for a different country and you're trying to get the same thing as me so well it kind of fit the brand of his guy anyway you know because yeah. it was an eccentric type of character but um yeah, I mean, I thought the game was quite good overall. I mean, was there anything in particular that stands out to you that you learned from uh, forgetting the, the technical stuff? But in terms of running something with PvP in it, was there a standout before we move into maybe the, us playing PvPs mm-hmm. together? Um, is there maybe a standout thing from that experience of running it? Yeah. Again, this was the, the first game that I'd, I'd run. And... I wanted to make it as challenging as possible for me because the way I was looking at it was if I make it as ridiculously difficult as possible what's the worst that can happen the next time around? Well, as it turns out my god, there was other <laughs> stuff that happened as well, yeah. right? But again, different different subject, different story so the player versus player aspect actually running it and doing it that was all right to be to be perfectly honest and the way that i'd done it i'd set up the two documents and i was Mm -hmm. giving these different pieces of information at the same time albeit it was the same information and you were just getting it slightly before slightly ahead whatever um or sorry slightly behind slightly Mm -hmm. ahead that that was all right and that helped to manage it because again i could speed things up for each group to keep everybody roughly the same and get everybody roughly through the story at the same time in future I might not do that and I don't mean the the mechanic I mean as I'm giving you the information um, the way that you get each group the information isn't really important it just kind of fits your scenario um, but you, you need to keep each half informed otherwise at some point you'll have a group miles Ahead, if they're puzzling it out before another group, mm, and you yeah. know, whatever you can end up having to run two games at the same time. So, giving each group information is probably a good thing to do. Um, again, how you go about doing it, no big deal. Um, and, and again, the main sort of issue with the player versus player is just making sure everybody knows what's going on. Because although I'd spent time before we started even making a commitment to playing the game, when it was originally put forward, like for me potentially doing the game, and I thought about it, and I went, right, okay, I'll, I'll do it, and that started happening. I explained before anybody even thought about coming up with characters, right, okay, here's what I'm thinking about doing. Is anybody particularly against the idea mm-hmm. of doing it? Mm-hmm. So we got a commitment from everybody beforehand because at the end of the day, there's no point in trying to run something like that if you've got players that don't want to be against each other. So we got that commitment beforehand, explained how I was going to do it, mm-hmm. and went through all the stages. And I tried to make everything explicit and clear, albeit there was the secret elements I thought I'd done a good enough job at explaining that but then when you get shot and toughed out the again, the flying snowmobile that um, yeah it turned out that I hadn't done as good a job as I thought I did oh that's it that's right that's why I was certain at the end that there was another faction yeah because I remember going damn it there was a faction how did I fall for this <laughs> Well, the um, thing was that you didn't. <laughs> you, you, stuck, you, you stuck to the brief. Um, but you could have said there was, and then it would have been like, what a mastermind. I, you know? It could have been. Um, but no, I'm 
<laughs> not just just leveling up for everybody to <laughs> to learn from my major mistakes there. Yeah. Um, but but that's the thing. No matter how clear you think you've been, it's just go an extra step, double check, triple check, quadruple check, whatever you need to do to make sure that is totally totally clear. And to me, that was the main the main thing with it because again, if it went off the rails and you had the players you know, pulling out an AK-47 and you're firing at each other from across a ballroom or whatever, Yeah. then you go, well, ultimately that's what they've decided to do and, you know, everybody's here to have fun and just roll with the chaos, see what happens. You know, so that, that's not really that big an issue and as long as everybody beforehand knows that, you know, it's player versus player, somebody is not going to come out on top here or if it ends up a stalemate well that's what's happened you know as long as everybody accepts that beforehand then you know if something does happen and somebody ends up a bit upset then you go well the the versus part was the giveaway here so that to me wasn't an issue and, and everything else it was just everybody knowing what to expect and as it was progressing through the kind of things that should well, not should be happening, but the kind of things that are kind of part of the plan and the things that are deviating from the plan. Um, and it meant ultimately that for the author, um, he ended up having a totally different game from you and the chameleon because you guys were completely aware of what was going on, whereas he was, you know, he was thinking there was more going on and, you know, potentially having less enjoyment because he's. <laughs> looking over his shoulder twice as much as everybody else but you know that being aside it, it's communication I think is the main thing that you need to watch out for with us I and speaking about that PvP component then I think um, I mean that's your experience running something that's got a core focus of PvP whereas mm. I mean I've done like I said I, the only PvP I've done is like basic PvP which you're, you're going to get in every game even if it isn't something that mm. you know you're probably going to clash heads with somebody um, but why don't we actually jump into talking about the uh, dream sequence that we had recently yeah let's do that so I've talked for quite a bit there and I'll let you start describing the dream sequence because okay, it sure. was this was your big moment in our long term campaign yeah a campaign which if you've not heard there's, there's been a dwarf a dwarven themed campaign we've played for like two and something I've said two and a half going on three years it's probably actually not been as quite as long as that it's, but over two years anyway yeah yeah so it started during some point during the lockdown so I think it's two by this point two years roughly um, mm-hmm. and we'd started other bits and pieces beforehand ah, but right, kind of around then yeah but and, yeah sorry go that, ahead. just in that ballpark anyway aye um, so yeah basically what it was was it was actually a, a bit of PvP that was sprung on us because mm-hmm. it was um, a mysterious just it was a dream sequence I can't remember if this was the whole game the dream sequence or not no from memory um, and again this was quite a while ago when we done this um, we had whatever events we had leading up to it and then it was, right, okay, let's rest up, go back to the camp, sleep, do what we're doing, restock, and then and what then we'll do All right. is in the morning we'll head out and we'll do whatever the plan was. And then that's when the dream sequence kicked in. Yep, so, and what it was, was it was almost ghosts of the past and one of the future um, that my, my main character... Who he's kind of like the the front man of the camp. It's a, a kind of moving dwarven camp we've got with an ultimate goal of getting back our hometown, our yeah. home village, or however big it actually is. Um, so yeah, it was basically just put up against two of these um, NPCs who I knew were going to be nasty because one of them was one of our previously dead characters, and mm-hmm. one was like an older version of. Jamie's character's wee boy who was a pain in the ass to begin with um, <laughs> or not to begin with he was a pain in the ass in recent times surrounding it mm-hmm. and then this was basically almost like a projection of him when he was older in this dream and then there was some big overall kind of deity serving thing that was there too mm-hmm. a monarch and it's called I don't know much about them just that they're big 
um, and probably dangerous. Um, and it was, yeah, basically that, that's the kind of summary of what was happening. But what happened as it started was Jamie and we'll keep the we'll keep the pseudo names. So yeah. Jamie and the chameleon mm-hmm. were given the were given character sheets for these characters, and I thought, oh Christ, I'm screwed because <laughs> I knew these guys could hit really bloody hard. I, mean, I didn't know about your your boy, your mm-hmm. character's boy, but I knew your guy could hit hard. So I was certain that you could hit hard as a barbarian, mm-hmm. a totem warrior, bear of the bear, um, barbarian, everything's half. So I wasn't that worried until your boy did psychic damage and I thought, oh, Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. But yeah, what was interesting about it was the fact that it was kind of surprised with, and I, no, I'm not mm-hmm. really against things like that because we've been doing a hardcore game. That, I mean, that's mm-hmm. been a hardcore game for a long time. But um, yeah, I think the thing for us that kind of made us all scratch our heads during it going, that we, we just don't know the outcome. There was so much ambiguity, and I think a lot of that was because it was ambiguous by nature. But yeah, you want to jump in, man? Yeah, there? yeah. I mean, that's the thing. So with the the bond game that I ran, that everybody played, everything was <laughs> or should have been explicitly put forward beforehand, so everybody knew it was PvP. And this dream sequence that played out, nobody knew that was happening. It got sprung on us. We get given character sheets over, again, we were using Rogue 20, they just all of a sudden appeared and we went, oh, right, okay, right. Oh, well, we started <laughs> quickly having a wee couple of minutes to read through and figure out what was going on. Um, now, the sides became really obvious at that point, you know, two characters you've never seen before and just Jordan's character there by himself. Well, I think it's pretty obvious that you're in a team of your own and you know, that's this was going to happen. Combat's about to happen, and you know, good luck. You know, <laughs> although I did pull some BS on you, my guys get a whole bunch of tricks up his sleeve, and I don't think you knew about the invisibility until I used it. And maybe I did use it before then. No, because we're level six, weren't we? I think I just earned it around then. Mm-hmm. But um, I anyway, I pulled out all the stops and actually tried to kill the big evil deity serving creature, mm-hmm. thinking mm-hmm. that that would stop the dream. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's not the first time that I've been the only target getting teamed up on, and but it's usually been NPCs. It's not been PCs. Yeah. But much more dangerous. <laughs> yeah, and that's the thing with us. It wasn't explained to us the consequences if we killed Jordan's character. It wasn't explained. Uh, and again, in the game that I ran, well, it was explained. Well, if you kill each other, then, well, that's it. <laughs> you know, they're, they're gone. But the difference is that that was in a one shot where the game was after it was complete was put on the shelf and probably never seen again still hasn't been seen thankfully um whereas in this campaign <laughs> that we're doing because it is a campaign that is long term then you know if somebody died then that's potentially a bit of a problem for camp politics and everything else that's going on but that wasn't explained beforehand and to be honest although we were taking this campaign a bit more serious in terms of how we were looking at the rules and how forgiving we're being with different things like damage and um, like regeneration of abilities through short rest, long rest, whatever. Um, I, I didn't actually think about the consequences and it was only after the game that we asked the author, um, who was the DM for this, we went... I remember I asked them, what would have happened if, you know, you'd all of a sudden drop down because somebody had whacked you? And it was, oh yeah, that, that would have been it. Mm-hmm. And at that point it was a bit kind of, a bit a bit of a shock, although it maybe shouldn't have been. Um, but I do remember at that point going, oh, I could have... <laughs> I could have killed Jordan's character. That would have... Oh, I don't know how I feel about that. I think... Um, I mean, I'm not opposed to surprises like that, to be honest. Especially mm. if it's maybe... The thing is, we know each other really well. And mm. if that's something like that happened... Um, I mean, I just I kicked her ass. That's what happened. <laughs> um, but it's... it. It's just one of these things we would have been fine with it. I think when the stakes are that high, though, I think there's there should normally be just from personal experience of running at times very brutal games, not like content wise, but in terms of difficulty, mm-hmm. brutal games. Um, you know, because there was many prompts that I'd had and asked about mm-hmm. about that mid game, 
And really, I think if you're going to, just this is more a tip if you're going to do this in the future with something like this that is potentially going to be a well, campaign ending sequence for a particular character. You know, I think if a player's going to inquire about stuff and, and, and ask, if you, even if you don't want to tell them, it's worth either dropping hints or at least putting it down to an ability check and at least letting the fate decide, fates decide. Mm-hmm. Um, because I'm sitting kind of thinking, man, because interestingly thinking back on it now, one of the characters who was there, your boy, when he was mm-hmm. older, was killed, but still hangs about later. Interestingly, that I'm yeah. thinking about it. So there's, there's kind of, there's not really an even playing field there, and I'm mm-hmm. sure there's low reasons for it, but I think... Um, well, I wasn't really that thing. To be honest, I was kind of expecting it. it there's been a few things up near around that point in the campaign where there was things that kind of just were sprung on you and you knew that consequences were generally just going to be you getting screwed over or killed. Mm. I mean, that was so. I mean, I knew straight away it was probably going to get killed. Although I don't think I actually heard them confirm it, to be honest. I, I can't remain, remember. Because it was one of these games we finished dead late at night, uh, yeah, so I probably yeah, checked it, out. It might not have been a direct confirmation, but there was... I do remember, Stuart. More, more, more than a good chance that that was the case, I think, is kind of... I think, in fact, I think that might have even been the way it was described to us, to be honest. Um, but, but yeah, and again, like... If it had happened, I wouldn't have been like if if the shoes were the other way around, right? If the boot was another foot, I wouldn't have been particularly upset either because before we started this we went right, okay, let's make things a bit more difficult, a bit more challenging. You know, let's let's up the ante a bit. So if it happened to me, I wouldn't have been too upset about it or anything, but I would I would have been a bit kind of surprised and a bit taken aback because that was the first time that had happened to us. Because um, this this was after my game, I think, mm-hmm, chronologically. It was, yeah, it was, so we'd, uh, we'd already done PvP with everybody, but beforehand it was all explicit. Everything was on the table, everything was out in the open. And this got sprung on us, but the consequences weren't pointed out and that was the thing that I was a bit surprised at and again it sounds strange if it had happened and it was my character that got killed I would have been you know right okay that's fine fair enough let's move on but if we'd ended up killing your character and that wasn't explained I would have been more upset about that and I would have been more more annoyed about that because although you go in if, if if a situation like that occurs then you need to give it your best shot otherwise you're not providing the challenge for the other person and you're you're not really playing fair if you're kind of within your ability because you're, yeah. you're you're trying yeah. to get them to win you're removing the element of of chance from it but it would have then made me go right okay hang on I'm potentially feeling a bit guilty here because I've now altered somebody else's game and playing experience from this point forward if I'd been told about it beforehand another person had been told about it beforehand that's fine, that's okay, everybody knows everybody's signed up, we're all in the same programme that's okay but when it's not explicitly explained then that's where I would have had a bit of an issue with that personally but what about you if that had like if it happened the other way about, what would have? I don't. I don't have a kind of big issue around ambiguity and maybe not getting told. I feel like once you you realise where the goalposts might be and ask, that's probably that's the only bit for me that maybe it wasn't done so well with it was it was basically just like ah, it doesn't matter. So it felt very just like cause that was really the response I got when I'm sure when I was asking about it. Um, and the problem is, I mean, really, I'm, you know, the character I was playing was using the initiative to kind of think, right, this could be the end. It's not just a dream or something more to it than that. Um, but it was kind of just fobbed off the, the comments. Mm-hmm. Whereas it should really at that point, I just mean from a player perspective, it actually should be it, at the very least put down to some form of intelligence or wisdom check, you know. Because mm-hmm. if you're desperate to know to tell somebody, just throw it down to that you know and you could easily fluff it you know I don't fluff stuff like that but mm-hmm. 
you know, you can just make it hard. <laughs> yeah. You know, because um, at least at that point, you know, it, it would be down to them what I was thinking. However, what I think did work well with it was that actually things like it felt, the stakes felt pretty goddamn big. I mean, they mm-hmm. felt big and I'm sitting going, I can't even wait to kill these two guys because I've been wanting to fight one of the PCs for ages. Like, I, w- I would love to have fought a character like the Chameleon's PC who died many, many, many games before this. Mm-hmm. But I was like, I wanted to see more of the cool stuff that the guy had in action because he didn't last that long. Yeah, And yeah. I did get to see it. Mm-hmm. it hurt bad um, but of course I killed him first and I think I killed you next after that um, but yeah it was it was a good uh, in terms of intensity it was a really intense fight you know I think I was down to like sub 20 hit points which I don't think had happened in like 6 months at that point mm-hmm. because I was yeah. souped up enough as a barbarian the totem bear totem barbarian um, so I think what did work was actually the ambiguity was cool I thought the, the intensity of it was just right. You guys didn't... I spoke about me, metagaming before. Mm-hmm. You guys weren't thinking like, oh, we'll, we'll just go easy on them. You know, you just gave mm-hmm. it everything you had. So I think actually in terms of a, a satisfying fight, I thought mm-hmm. it worked really well because I'm, I'm not a big fan of long fighting sequences, but this mm-hmm. one felt quite dynamic because of the PvP element. Yeah. Um, I just think really the only thing I would say in terms of feedback is... Or the things that didn't work so well for it was, I think, really, there should have been a bit more of. I don't mind not having almost a buy in for the PvP because that would have ruined the surprise of it. Mm-hmm. But after it was inquired, you know, in the game, there should have been either some sort of, sort of hint, suggestion, or just down to a check, I think. Because mm-hmm. at that point, you know, I think from that point onwards, I just kind of thought, do you know what? Probably every major opportunity that comes up to us. It's probably going to get me killed, and that's pretty much been the same thing for like the last seven months, you know, because mm-hmm. it's and it, it really has actually. But it's a shame though because it did. It's now put a, a bit of a lens on every event that happens. I'm like, right, this is the guys trying to get killed now. This is this is me an attempted murder on my character. Um, mm-hmm. Whereas I think even just a wee bit of the suggestion of what was happening once I'd sussed what was happening, either mm-hmm. confirmation or suggestion to the confirmation that I had mm. um, would have been enough to make me go, okay. And then I think that would have helped for my stakes as well. So I think as the fight got on, I think once I defeated the Chameleons guy, I, I wasn't as worried, to be honest. I was worried about mm-hmm. your psychic powers, but I was like, well, that's two of them down. Mm-hmm. So, and I've got a Vorpal Blade and stuff, so I'm like, it's just a numbers game. I just need to stay in long enough um, and just keep rolling my reckless yeah. attack until the, twi- the Nat 20 comes up again. Um, but I think knowing actually having a confirmation that actually you could seriously die it would have made me kind of second guess actually doing reckless mm-hmm. attack on your character who did psychic damage now I'm thinking about it <laughs> but I um, I think that's that's really it I think overall it was, it was a good PvP experience I just I, for me it was just just having that kind of okay you could seriously die even if it's just narratively that could have been dropped in that's the only yeah. thing that could have maybe improved it because after that it kind of just feels like everything's going to be a you're going to die if, if you hit zero hit points you're just going to die it doesn't really matter the the route to that happening if mm-hmm. it's a dream sequence or not it kind of feels like there's no rules um, although to be honest it, pro- it has actually been like that really because mm-hmm. of some certain events that have happened in the, the recent games but yeah. it's definitely it's not a big boy campaign though so it's a that's always been the risk though it's not like that's changed it it just means that the goalposts have changed a wee bit and how to approach certain things yeah so my guy doesn't die um yeah and again just kind of reiterating what i said earlier like the actual player versus player element to it i was fine that was no problem the fact that it got sprung on us that, that was actually good. I like the fact that it sprung on us because we weren't surprise. expecting it. It was yeah. a surprise. Again, keeps everybody on their toes, keeps everybody kind of guessing, and, you know, kind of a different dynamic, changes the game up, all really good stuff. But again, the, this thing that I was a bit, again, afterwards, a bit kind of not upset because I wasn't, you know, wasn't in a mood and a half, you know, nothing like that. But... It was just I felt a little bit cheated at that point. The fact that we weren't told that this had serious consequences and this wasn't just the dream. 
although the suspicion was there, it wasn't confirmed. And because we'd never done player versus player through um, through any of the author's games, let alone this campaign, and the only time we'd done player versus player was in the Bond campaign and in the lead up to it because it was the first time that I was doing that as a or sorry the first game that I'd ran and through talking to the author and, and you and mm-hmm. the chameleon because they'd all they've all ran more games than I have basically everybody I think apart from yourself you just kind of went do whatever you want on you go that was pretty much mm-hmm. your kind of limit of advice and input because you weren't wanting to sway what I was doing Whereas the other two guys, when I was talking to them, the two of them went, right, okay, you can do the player versus player, but it's going to be a challenge. And they they didn't properly try to steer me away from it, but they kind of pointed out the sort of red flags to it. So maybe I had a slightly different context for that because of my game and because I got kind of warned about how difficult it could potentially be then it comes up out the blue as a surprise and then it kind of potentially alters the the course of our campaign whereas with my game you know it didn't alter the course of anything you know so I think it was just the kind of the kind of unexpected element of it is is the thing Um, whereas at the start of it if it was you know, if we get told again whether it was a hint or whether it was explicit, the actions in this combat will have got uh, your actions, and then the next encounter, the next bit of combat are going to have long term consequences. So, whether that was explicitly said, or even if there was an implication of, you know, what, you know, don't go easy on them, but just remember that, you know, this is this is serious for your character or you know whatever um, I just think that heads up would have been would have been welcome yeah I mean for me I think it's the, I don't I mean things I'm coming from I, I, I'm kind of by that point I was just expecting every time somebody was fighting me there was going to be some nonsense that comes in I probably said that during the campaign mm-hmm. loads of times as well and I'm expecting nonsense to be the kind of put the fall of the character um, and that was another kind of thing I went right this is another thing that will kill me um, but I think once my character started figuring that out that's probably really when uh, once the guy makes the connection and that's where the kind of confirmation of suggestion should probably come in more just because you know I think for you guys it's a wee bit different because it's like you guys are teaming up on a surprise you're teaming up against mm-hmm. somebody Was I was like right as soon as I knew you got a character sheet I went right I'm gonna kill him first, and I'll kill him. <laughs> just because I knew where it was going, you know. But um, yeah, and speaking about um, impact and long term games, I think we should move into the next one. Yeah, I think I think we probably should do. So what we'll do then is why don't speaking of long term consequences, why don't we move into the next thing then, which is dear, near and dear to our dear Jamie here. So take it away. Yeah, so um, betrayal, <laughs> betrayal amongst friends. Um, yeah, so basically, um, in our long term campaign, uh, and this was not the last game, the game before last game. Yeah. So, you know, still quite raw about this. Um, is that we ended up with player versus player combat now. It was obvious it was going to happen because the context to this was Jordan couldn't make it to the previous game. So myself and the chameleon, we went about and done a kind of a side mission, a side shoot to fill the time as much as anything. But it did relate to the main thread of the campaign and what we were doing. We were trying to generate some income for the camp. So we went off and and done the kind of usual. Um, and then... The next time Jordan was available, he was there. And whilst we were playing the game, but it, it was very silent, very solemn. Wasn't saying too much. Smirking the whole time that he was there. Yeah, pretty so, much. Yeah. You, you, we were sitting going, right, he's going to be involved at some point. 
and we're kind of looking at the time. Right, he's not appeared yet. I no. didn't expect to be at the sidelines that long, although they thought I was going to be coming back with my big <laughs> purple Duragar, you know. Um, but well, to be honest, me and the chameleon, we were messaging each other privately on the side and going, right, okay, do you think it's this character? Ah, I'm not sure, so we were kind of we're cheating a bit. We were kind of getting the strategy going beforehand. Um, but anyway, oh, that's funny enough, there's a chameleon there, just spotted. Um, yeah. yeah, funny. Ear must be itching. It must be indeed. Um, so we, we were going through and it's in our usual sort of right, okay, let's call it quits and nobody's too tired and the enjoyment doesn't get sapped. We're, we're, we're starting to get near that sort of deadline and we're going, right, Jordan's still not appeared here. Maybe this is a false alarm. Maybe uh, yeah. he's literally just here to see what's happening, to see if explaining the next time and he's jumping in every so often and having a chat with us if we're going and getting a break. You've probably, like seen, me, you've probably seen me reading my book as well because I'm looking at running a cult Divinity Lost game. So I was yep. reading that and I'm going, I don't know when I'm coming in. Could I, yep. You could see it flicking. I noticed and I was like, oh God. <laughs> you could see it in the cult. camera. Just the bits of the pages <laughs> flipping. It was funny. Yeah, so all that clicks along and then <laughs> all of a sudden, bang, combat. Right, that's fine. We've already had a sequence of combat that Jordan wasn't involved in. Very surprising kept us on our toes again all good elements here anyway so we get into the combat and we go right it's definitely this guy here still wasn't Jordan going all right okay well there's only two people here and it was definitely not him and definitely not him Mm, right okay so we get involved in the combat and then all of a sudden somebody appears just completely out the blue we're invisible now they're not invisible and it's me standing in the middle of three different people by myself and <laughs> yeah and, and everything happened from there so what happened this time around was player versus player got sprung on us like um, the the previous time it happened in the long term campaign maybe there's a pattern emerging here for player versus player in our campaign maybe there is um, the sides were Again, very obviously clear. And I t- <laughs> pretty much the same as last time. It was you versus me and the chameleon. Funny. Yeah, it's funny that. Although what I would say, though, is a lot. it was sprung it, and it was a surprise and I knew it was coming up and I was, I was so ready. I was so ready. Um, because I knew there was no stakes for me. Mm-hmm. It was all for you. Although the thing is, what was nice with this one was, I think partly because of the experience with the last time, this one was quite clearly like mm. if you die you die in this one you know yeah. so that was the kind of thing where I felt like this was actually probably the better of the PVPs we've had in it because yeah. goalposts were clear you know we didn't need it explained yeah. obviously but um, yeah there was also a nice reveal though because I was sneaking up behind him the whole time he had no idea and boom yep yep so oh. do you want to tell them why it was even better with the first two, pretty much the first two attack rolls that happened to you. <laughs> yeah, well, the first two attack rolls were both critical, so I started dropping hit points fast. Uh, it was it was rapid. So from that point, I spent the whole combat sequence weighing up. Right, should I run? Should I fight? Should I? You know, I rather than being quite relaxed and just engaging in the combat yeah. and seeing what happened and then figuring that out as it went on very quickly I dropped a lot of hit points and then I had to start thinking right how do I start getting them back or how do I start turning the odds in my my favour um, the problem was because one uh, NPC was in front of me and Jordan's um, temporary character yeah. um, was then behind me it meant that if I tried to leave I was getting hit twice mm-hmm. from attacks of opportunity, which, again, if you're completely new and you've got no idea what I'm talking about, if you think about it as basically a free attack from running away from somebody, mm-hmm. that's basically what it is. So would they get hit twice before their next turn where they could then close down the distance again, then attack, and then if I tried to leave again, I would have got attacked again. So there was a lot, a lot of kind of thinking that I had to do at this point um, and then 
at that point remembered that I'd just been given a magic weapon which could allow me to do a, a short teleport. Managed to do that, managed to get away, managed to get some distance, get a couple of health potions in and I think by the end the whole combat sequence, because spoilers, I didn't make it. Um, I think we worked out that I went through like double my amount of hit points through potions and abilities and other things. It was a lot of damage that I took through that whole sequence. Um, so, and again, like Jordan was saying, this time around, it was very clear, you know, no, <laughs> nobody went to sleep and woke up in a dream. It was all combat, all obvious. So, again, this was totally, totally fine in my book, although it got sprung on us because, again, we knew it was combat when we went into it. Um, and, you know, we've all discussed beforehand that this is going to be a, you know, a more serious campaign, so there's going to be less wiggle room, if you like, if things don't necessarily go according to the plan or the overall story or things. So that was all fine, that was all okay. Um, and then, again, in the end, up, what happened was a character that managed to keep alive for just about two years didn't make it. So, oh, um, so that was, um, you know, an, an end, an end of of an era, which then now means that when we're now playing and going back to the campaign proper rather than the side shoots, that Jordan is now the last original character left. Yes, I know that's right. I don't imagine that's going to last long though. Just wait. Um, I know. I think it was. It's definitely been the better of the the, the um, PVPs, and I think just because of a mix of just we understood we, mm. we, we were, what we were doing. I mean, even though my guy was a monster, it was. He's probably you got him down to within another round. I mean, really, the only reason that Jamie's character didn't he, um, didn't he win was because probably if I didn't get the critical at the start. Mm. Or if you avoided one of the hits, that was enough for you to... Yeah, because we, we kind of sat and talked about it afterwards it because um, obviously, again, we'd lost a character that'd been there for a while so everybody was kind of talking about it and things and uh, it, we'd basically worked it out that the amount of damage on a kind of rough average that my character can put out, it was literally a round, round and a half he had left to survive which then when you look back at it and you go well if one of those critical hits never happened that would have made a huge difference yeah. and he could have potentially survived if both the critical hits never happened, again could have potentially guaranteed. survived yeah. Yeah. and then because of the magic item that I had and it was literally I think I got it literally the game before Mm-hmm. Yeah, he did. And it yeah. was towards the end of the game that I got it. So I completely, I, I never forgot it was there because I was using it because it, it was a magic weapon and it had other abilities as well. But because it was so new and because it could do a lot of things, I was unfamiliar with it. And if I'd realised about the teleport, when that had all happened, I could have A, teleported and avoided the damage as well as if I'd done it when it would have been most opportune to do it, then I also would have avoided those critical hits. So you can argue, well, the critical hits were the critical hits because that's what happened when the dice got rolled. But when it was me not remembering about something I could do, then you go, right, well, if that one event had changed, it would have been... Or could have potentially could have been, been completely changed. different. So yeah. it was it was a bit of a sore one as well. Um, like for me at that point, because you're going, I've I've managed <laughs> I've managed to keep him alive this long, and because just because a, a, a slip of the mind basically that he got done in. <laughs> I I think then just taking that, I think is there anything else really in this one? I mean, other than that, then, is there anything that you think, what, if you say, I want to pick, I think we've kind of covered it, but is there anything that stands out that you don't think worked so well for it? I think, for me, the only real thing was there was a wee bit of post-game discomfort, not because of you getting killed mm. so much, 
It was more like, because my guy was like, they, they just, as far as my NPC guy was concerned, mm-hmm. they killed my employer. And I knew that these guys had a bounty in their head. So I'm mm-hmm. like, well, I can literally take one of their heads, which mm-hmm. is what I'd done. So you didn't even get really a chance for death saving throws. So I felt a wee bit guilty about that. Mm-hmm. Um, I got over it quite quick. But <laughs> um, no, but seriously, it was like, uh, it was, I was, I'm sitting going, oh, and I remember the, the DM at the time was like, don't go easy on them. And I thought, well, okay, I won't go easy. How would I do this if it wasn't your character? Then I'm like, well, that's that's probably what I would have done if yeah. I was, and you know. But I think other than kind of post game discomfort, is there anything that kind of stands out? What do you think? Like a thing that worked and what didn't work? Well, I think overall it worked. I don't think there was anything like technically that happened in it that you went right. Well, that wasn't good or anything. Right, I think everything was was fine from the kind of mechanical point of view and and all that sort of thing. The only thing I would say is that for us, we are all in acceptance in this campaign that, you know, we're, you know, we're not going to be given too much slack when it comes to any decisions or anything like that. So that was all fine. That was all okay. If you try and copy something like that for your campaign and the players aren't expecting it or they're new players or they all think they're having a nice, easy, you know, just killing a bit of time, not taking it too serious and you spring that on them, then it's going to shock them. You'll get people that are upset and and all sorts of things. So for kind of lighter campaigns, that's not going to work. If you're doing it more serious than that's it's no bother you know because everybody's all again signed up in an agreement again with this it got sprung on us and there wasn't an explicit oh by the way if you kill anybody here that's it game over mm-hmm. but yeah. because it was combat and because you were just another enemy at that point yeah and in every other game in this campaign and other campaigns you know that if you drop down with zero hit points and you fail your death saving throws then that's it so you know nothing to change rule wise or anything the only thing that changed is rather than player versus DM it was player versus player and that was all that changed so there was nothing you know there was nothing wrong if you like from that point of view Um, and the only things to watch out for I would say is in fact there wasn't discussed beforehand and you know things like that and whether your players are your players are up for that and you need to gauge that yourself again if it's a lighter campaign or if it's newer players avoid if it's a more serious campaign or you've got experienced players go for it try it see what happens but again if you do if you do do it and somebody kills somebody else at the table then you know expect fireworks expect the fallout from that and don't say we didn't warn you yeah I mean I would totally agree I think um, the thing is we've we've known each other a long time we, we know mm. the style of the game we know it's a brutal type of game and yep. sure the thing is we, we get each other a lot so we get on mm. and if we know if something like that happened we wouldn't be sitting sulking over it for like three weeks I've had players that have mm. sulked over not getting a bit of backstory you know um but I mean, because there's been even things in the campaign that I wouldn't have run it the way that it's been run. Because there's various things I might disagree with, or uh, types of decisions that I wouldn't agree with that's maybe happened in their campaign. But we also, you know, it's not me that's running it, and we're all happy to to go with the flow with it, you know. Mm-hmm. So I think what you're saying there regarding like warnings for people. Um, I think really the main thing is being clear with people where goalposts can be and even if you don't want to give them it, give them it as a suggestion um, at least or if they use their initiative to actually try and pry into what it is, give them some sort of reward. This this kind of goes back to the mm-hmm. basics of running a game um, and, and giving players positive feedback at least. So this would be the reward for, you know, if they inquired about something like that, inquired about the dream sequence being lethal or not, lethal, lethal or not um, really there should have been a wee bit of a suggestion that yes it was probably lethal unless I've got all that mixed up and it turns out maybe it wasn't but um, yeah but when you're running your games with PvP with players that maybe you don't know so well that Mm. you've never done PvP you've maybe not done something as hardcore it's certainly something to watch out for because people shoot something I find 
sometimes either newer players or very experienced players tend to kind of argue your your thoughts as, as mm. DM sometimes but the problem is oh, other times people will be okay with it but when it comes to killing player characters you know people get quite attached to them you know I've been playing yep. this guy for two years I'll be bummed when he dies but I've also got like three other characters I'm ready to play you know because mm-hmm. I know that's how the cookie crumbles uh, whereas I think you know when it comes to to you dealing with your first set of player character deaths, mm-hmm. um, just maybe try not to have it as a PvP unless yeah. If you do do it, just make it. Just be clear with people what the consequences might be. Um, yeah. I can, an example I can give is like recently, I, one of my players couldn't make a game. It wasn't PvP, but because I knew that at least three of them were probably going to die out of the mm-hmm. seven, I was like, I, I wasn't comfortable running the game until one of the players was there because mm-hmm. he was the one that was low. Um, and they all said no let's keep going so I was like well it is going to be hard because they knew Mm -hmm. what they were fighting it's going to be difficult and you could die and that means um, I'll call him D Um, D you've got a good chance that your guy will die before you get to play him again if Mm -hmm. if you allow him to kind of go ahead and that kind of worked out his uh, personality and stuff with you run away and things and he's Mm -hmm. like no he would stay so I'm like that was your out that was your out man (laughs) But overall, the thing is, no, actually, nobody actually died, surprisingly. But the the thing is, the clarity helped them. You know, yep. they, they, it made them comfortable with it. So that's the only thing I would say um, yeah. with PvP overall. Um, you get any more closing thoughts? I think we've pretty much, from, from my point of view, I think I've pretty much said that yep. each of the different scenarios and I've given the kind of context for each one and how it's how it's slightly different. So, for example, the Bond game. Again, the, the main thing, clarity and communication. Said well, although it didn't work out, but anyway, but you know, from <laughs> from from the, the outset, we went right, okay. There will be player versus player. You're not going to know who's on whose side. Blah 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 blah. Set it all out beforehand. The game unfolds, and everybody knows if somebody dies, they die. Right, okay. Everybody accepts that. Everybody's okay with that. So I got engaging the players beforehand. I'd done an outline of the game beforehand and then we got into it. The other two scenarios, it gets sprung on us, but it gets sprung in a group where we'd been playing for a year and a bit at this point, yeah. this particular campaign. And again, the group of players, we've been playing together for three, four years or whatever and it is. Known each other and we've for much known longer. each other. Yeah for a lot longer than that yeah. so there's a lot of um, I'm trying to think of the way of describing that but basically without explicitly turning around and talking about right okay this is what's going to happen blah 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 there was already the clarity from the type of people we are personally and we're playing ga- the game you know what we expect from the game so that was already there and then the only thing that was missing, if you ask me, from the, the other two scenarios was the first time around. Again, not so much the second time mm-hmm. around yeah. because the second time around it was open combat. So all's fair and all square at that point. Uh, from the second time around is because it was a dream sequence and because as well as it being the dream sequence, it was two characters that weren't myself and the chameleon's characters. So there was a ambiguity there that wasn't hinted at or heavily hinted at or overtly explained so that to me would be the kind of difference between the scenarios and how the clarity comes in beforehand get a gauge in the players if you don't have a gauge in if, if you don't have that prior knowledge of the players then ask them figure out whether this is going to work with them personality wise or not um, and then after that point, either explicitly explain what's going on. Again, if it's newer players or players you haven't played with a lot, lay out the rules beforehand. And if you're not going to do that, because again, it's perfectly fine not to do it. Don't you know? Panic and double down and the kind of setting the law out beforehand. And then at least give them some hints as it's going on that there are going to be consequences here don't leave them totally blind because even if it's something that's experienced if they're not expecting this and you pull that on them then it's completely different if 
that happens to an NPC, somebody that ultimately could be in the story, could be out of the story, and it's not going to affect their character or them personally. Whereas when it's somebody that they're playing or somebody that one of their friends or whoever mm-hmm. else they're playing with is suddenly not there anymore, then they're either going to feel a bit cheated or worse than cheated is, is guilty, I would say. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a good kind of wrap-up for it because... I mean, when you talk about um, even being explicit, you know, you don't even need to say, yeah, this actually is what it is. Mm -hmm. You can just say, look, as far as your character's concerned, Mm -hmm. if you die, you're dead. That's it. So that that doesn't confirm or deny it at all. It just just, frames it for that individual Mm -hmm. and it removes... The ambiguity is a problem because that's where sometimes people can feel guilty or... But more, yeah, cheated's really the big one you want to avoid. Um, anything you do in D&Ds or any role playing game if you can make it narratively work it tends mm-hmm. to work but if you don't do that you tend to find people are just like how did that happen how did this mm-hmm. guy get sneak up on me and I didn't know you know I never got to check for it you get sometimes you get that quite a lot yeah. so it's about it's about being clear and narratively clear as well but... yeah yeah. quick so, question for you though what's worse feeling cheated or feeling guilty because you've done something that's affected somebody else Um, it depends on the person Depends on person. Yeah, I mean, I didn't feel cheated when I got to kill you, but... Well, that's this because you, you didn't feel cheated. No. <laughs> you you would have felt guilty if you were going to feel anything, surely. Ah, I felt a wee bit guilty at first, but it, that was swift. Aye. Yeah. But then moving on to each other, you know, because did, it did kind of me go, oh, God, mm. maybe I should have cut his head off, like, because you never get a chance for death saves. That was the only thing I was kind of like... Mm. I don't know about that because the poor guy just got a huge magic weapon we spent flaming six grand on or something. Oh yeah, that's the other thing. Uh, camp. Now, now <laughs> camp do what, I do feel a wee bit cheated uh, after, uh, now I'm thinking about it. That was a six grand piece mm. of enjoyment or six grand fight I just had. Yeah. It just cost us six grand. Um, bye. Yeah. yeah. I think then that's kind of the main stuff then. So you've heard kind of some examples now we've not went into in super detail and technically mm. and maybe something we can explore in the future is actually designing a PvP encounter yeah. I would be quite keen on that even if we did it almost like live like with the podcast um, but you've heard our take so what's your thoughts on it do you want I mean I'm sure you still maybe would want to do PvP if you ever want to do it before this but has your opinion on it changed has your approach changed do you think we're talking nonsense? Do you think you'd be more hardcore than what we're talking about? We'd just love to hear your perspective because, you know, sure we run games, I mean, I particularly myself run games for quite a few different groups of people and, and that I find I learn a lot from that. So, But that's a limited group, even mm-hmm. though it's a, quite a few more groups. So, you know, for me and, and for Jamie as well, yeah. it's important just to hear what you guys have to say yourselves about. Um, how Give us an example of PvP you've run that went bad and mm-hmm. or went good. I'm more interested in the stuff that's went bad to make sure I don't do it in the future. <laughs> but um, I would love to hear both sides. Have you got anything to add? Uh, yeah, uh, again, that's the thing. Although we're here and we're giving our take and we're hopefully helping um, newer players you know, figure out what they want to do and giving them tips and pointers and things where we're certainly not saying that we are experts and this is the way that you need to do things. So if there are even more experienced players out there than us, then jump in in the comments if you're watching or listening to this on YouTube or, again, any of the social media platforms and give us your experience as well. You know, we're not... You know, we're not going to just casually ignore them and <laughs> pretend they're not there. So give us, give us your opinion as well on what happened. But, um, yeah, other than that, I think all that's left to say is thanks for watching or thanks for listening, depending on where you are and how you're, how you're getting to us. And uh, if you can remember to like, subscribe, share and follow and, you know, whatever else is is appropriate for wherever you are just now and do all the internet magic and uh, yeah that's pretty much it I think yeah that's it so guys thanks for listening or watching wherever you are Um, it's great so we can't wait to see your responses and we'll catch you next time yeah